Hello and welcome to video lesson 30. Today we will continue uh, talking about the early silent era and the early cinema in Indian uh, history. So, before we do that, before we move on to the next part, let us do a quick recap of what we talked about in the last lesson. So, in the last lesson we talked about the history of or the beginning of uh, filmmaking uh, as a practice in India. Uh, we discussed the various precursors that impacted or that had some kind of an effect in the way cinema came to develop in India. We talked about the pioneers of Indian filmmaking and we also explored the various themes and genres that came to, that came to uh, make or base the foundation of the silent era films. Now, in today's lesson, what we are going to do is, we are going to talk about the arrival of sound in films. So, how was it that this impacted the kind of films, the kind of stories that were being told or the narrative structure or the basic format of the film. We will also talk about the major filmmakers and the major films of the time and we will discuss the concept of studio era, uh, of studio, uh, era that came to be in the Indian cinema history. By the end of this lesson, you would have learnt a couple of things. You would have gained an understanding of what was the impact of the arrival of cinema, uh, of the arrival of sound in films. You will also be able to understand how was it that the evolution of the talkie film happened, which was actually an impact, uh, which was actually a result of the introduction of sound. You will also be able to understand the various characteristics, you will be able to describe the various characteristics that make the talkie films. And you will also be able to study or understand the, the studio era in context of the Indian scenario or the Indian setting or the Indian context and its contribution to cinema that we uh, see or that we look at today. Uh, now, let us get on with the uh, lesson. So, arrival of sound. Arrival of sound very simply means that before uh, sound could be integrated into films, films usually were accompanied by a live orchestra or live musicians. But with the arrival of sound, sound could now be integrated as part of the filmmaking process. So, while you were recording your visuals, you could also simultaneously record sound and music along with uh, along with the visuals and that had a great impact in uh, in the format of the of, of the film of how this film was being told now by the 1930s as as you may recall we were talking about it uh, in the last lesson by the 1930s more than 200 films a year were, were being produced in india and that is a huge number compared to the fact like looking at the fact that india was to, was only beginning to uh, step into the process of filmmaking. So, 200 films per year was actually a huge achievement. It also gave some prominent stars, some prominent actors of the time, namely you had Sita Devi, you also had Himan Shurai, Devi Karani and uh, also Patience Cooper. So, these were the major actors who were actually almost gaining a star status. Silent cinema at that time was having a pretty good run. So, uh, people were really thronging the theatres and looking at all the kind of different uh, films, the different genres that the filmmakers had to offer. However, with the arrival of sound, like the arrival of sound also brought an end to the good run that the silent films were happening because this was another innovation. So, till now people were really intrigued, people were really excited by looking at moving images on the screen. Now, they could also have music along with it. Uh, they could have dialogues along with it. They could have characters on screen say something and they would be able to listen to what was being said. So, in 1927, as you may recall, the first talkie film in America was produced, which was uh, The Jazz Singer. And in 1931, the first talkie in India came forward, which was Alam Ara and it was produced by Ardeshir Irani. So, now this film actually, we can say that it, uh, the, the song and dance sequence that we are so used to in the Hindi cinema and in the Indian cinema can actually be traced back all the way to this film, the Alam Ara. Now, this film consisted of seven songs in all and it came on and it began to establish this very unique flavour that developed into Indian cinema that we are so used to today. So, it created a format, you know, that became very quintessential to Indian cinema that makes Indian cinema very unique and very different from the other kinds of cinema that we are so used to like, you know, the American cinema or the European cinema, uh, which 
uh, generally it does not have a lot of song and dance sequence. Now, other filmmakers after looking at the success of Alamara followed suit. So, what they did was these producers they transformed their old studios when where they were making silent cinema to accommodate the production of sound to accommodate the production of the sound cinema or films that could now have dialogues and musics in them. So, theatre owners also made a similar arrangement. Theatre owners now made sure that they had the infrastructure to actually showcase films that had sound in them. So, this is how changes in the filmmaking industry were happening with the arrival of sound. By the late 1930s, almost all of the uh, industry was overhauled including Bombay and Calcutta. So, all these theatres that had initially been producing silent cinema had turned into uh, studios that were now working with sound and sound film. Song and dance as I said became this very important part of specifically Indian cinema. A film came in the year 1931 after Alamara known as Indra Sabha. This film had as many as 70 songs which was a huge number. Now, we can understand that how important the entire music and song culture became to uh, cinema that was being produced in India. Now, a lot of these devices that were visible in the cinema were the ones that had been borrowed from the Parsi theatre. So, Parsi theatre continues to be a very important influence in the films that we watch today. Now, all of this was happening and the domestic films started to surpass the foreign films in popularity. So, the Indian audiences, the audiences started going for the domestic films much more and not as much for the foreign films. In fact, there came a time when uh, foreign films accounted for only 10 percent of the films that were being showcased or that were being screened on the big screens and that was a huge win for the domestic film industry. Another thing that happened with the arrival of sound was that it started posing this very big question. We have talked about it a little bit, but this question of language. Because up till the silent era, you did have regional cinema. By regional, we meant play films that were being produced in specific centers, in specific cities in the country. But with the arrival of sound, what language would the film be made in? That became a big question because now you would have actors on screen who would talk, who would deliver dialogues. Now, Bombay was this city where the vernacular language was, a, was a either Marathi or Gujarati, right. But in order to come to a consensus as to which language would become the one that dominates the, uh, the screens, you know, uh, of the films that are being produced in Bombay, uh, there were some other devices that were put into use. Now, a certain version of Hindi was actually vi very widely spoken and understood in and around the Bombay area, which was actually Hindustani. Now, Hindustani was a mix of Hindi and Urdu and it was popular in the trading centers. Now, as emphasized earlier, Bombay was this commercial center. So, you had people coming from all walks of life, coming from different places, different countries. So, Hindi had sort of, uh, or Hindustani, so to say, had become this language that had become common. And this then informed, uh, informed the decision where the cinema that was being uh, produced in Bombay took up Hindustani as its language. So, therefore, the films that were now being made in Bombay, they were separate from its regional identity. Unlike the other regional cinema where vernacular language and the vernacular culture started having some kind of an impact on the narrative, on the stories that were being told, with Bombay it was different. Bombay, Bombay would tell stories that a larger generation or that a larger number of people at that point of time would be able to understand and therefore, to this day, Bombay remains uh, this industry that we uh, that so many people fondly call uh, Bollywood industry that uh, makes films in the dominant Hindi language. So, now moving on, what happens is that the films produced in the Bombay studios they took on a more national kind of a character as opposed to a very regional character. So they catered to a larger audience and gradually developed a distinct form that catered to this huge audience from all walks of life across the length and breadth almost of the entire country. Now, uh, what happened was that the popularity of this particular kind of cinema amongst the audience, it started really gaining ground. 
and new production companies then uh, started to emerge very very quickly so these new production companies would, would produce more films and the industry started to thrive in fact in the year 1931 a total of 328 films were produced again a very huge number so this is how the arrival of sound in uh, films uh, began in the indian uh, in the indian context and various changes that had happened now let us talk about the overall impact or and what all different changes happened uh, you know in the indian uh, cinema industry in the indian filmmaking industry once sound was introduced as a important component in the cinema so one of the first things that happened was that it altered the structure of the film and india then developed a very unique style a very unique uh, format uh, that was uh, indian uh, as we as mentioned earlier the use of song and dance so a lot of song uh, you know where the actors would sing the songs on screen that became a very relevant and a very unique style to india uh, the arrival of sound also did another thing is that it opened up the avenues for a lot of jobs that actually did not exist during the silent era so there was now this whole separate section in the filmmaking industry where sound played a very important role so automatically jobs like those of dialogue writers of uh, lyricists who would write the uh, lyrics for songs of sound recorders music composers and all these different jobs uh, were created so sound the arrival of sound also created a fresh number of jobs uh, another thing uh, that happened with uh, the with the arrival of sound was that now the actors were also expected to sing so along with the acting the actors had to be able to sing however something very interesting happened when in the year 1935 the technique of playback singing was introduced now this is again a very unique characteristic to indian cinema where the actors on screen would just lip sync while the actual singer who had sung the song uh, would uh, would not be on screen so these would these would be pre recorded songs that the actors would link uh, would lip would lip sync upon now what this also did was that a lot of playback singers also became stars in their own right because now you had these playback singers who would be voicing for the actors on the screen and they gained this aura around them now introduction of sound uh, the arrival of sound did another very important thing which was that it gave a massive boost to regional cinema so films now started to be made in the vernacular languages so you also had talkies in bengali in tamil and in telugu so jamai shastri was the first talkie film in bengali kalidas was the first talkie film in tamil and bhakt prahlad was the first talkie film in telugu now what all of this did was that it went on to establish the regional cinema as in a very firm kind of a foundation so with the arrival of sound these were the kind of changes and this was the kind of impact that it had more so in terms of how the industry was now structuring itself now let's talk about the studio era so we have already talked about the studio era with regards to uh, american cinema and how studios there functioned however studio era in uh, the indian context was different it, to an extent it was relatively a shorter period of time uh, in indian cinema and it was different because no one studio held complete monopoly of the system so you had a lot of smaller studios that would come and there were a lot of studios that would emerge that would quickly emerge and as quickly vanish so there was no monopoly that was practiced by the studios in the indian context what had happened was that like the distribution the production the distribution and the exhibition it was not an integrated process so one studio did not do all the different things uh, which is why uh, studios never really were able like even if they wanted to that they, they were never really able to practice monopoly so but another thing that happened uh, the other uh, the way in which the studio system or the studio era worked in uh, india was that every studio kind of developed uh, a style or a genre that was very specific to them or that was very unique to them so we will now look at some different studios that came up and the kind of films that they were associated with so what this also meant was that there was not a lot of 
uh, uh, competition between one studio to the other because they had all developed a very unique style that was their own. So let's look at some studios that existed at that point of time. There was the Imperial Films Company that was based in Bombay. In Pune, you had the Prabhat Film Company, New Theatres in Calcutta. Then you also had Bombay Talkies and Vadia, a movie tone. And actually some of these studios had existed in the silent era, but as sound had been introduced, they had continued, they had adapted and continued into the era of the sound and therefore had maintained their integrity as a studio that would then go on to produce uh, uh, talkies and films with sound. Let's talk about the Imperial Film Company first. So this film company was established in the year 1926 by uh, Ardashir Irani, who was a Parsi filmmaker. This particular studio was associated with the historical drama genre and uh, it also had its own exhibition setup. So it produced films and it also uh, exhibited them. One of the first films uh, that came along from this particular production company was Alamara, uh, which was also the first talkie film that we just talked about. The actors that came to be associated with this particular production uh, company were people like Sulochna, Zubeda, Prithvi Raj Kapoor. In the year 1937, this company also produced a film called Kisan Kanhaiya. Now this film has the advantage, not, not the advantage, but this film is actually the first film that used colour. So it was the first film that introduced the concept of colour because up till then films were being produced in black and white films. Another thing important to this particular studio is that because it was based in uh, Bombay, it did not make films only in Hindi. It made of films in a lot of different languages which included Urdu, Gujarati, Telugu, Tamil, Marathi and as well as foreign languages like Burmese, Pashto and even Farsi. The second important uh, film studio that existed in the time was the Prabhat Film Company. This film company had uh, opened up in the year 1929 in Kolhapur, but in the year 1933 it shifted base to Pune. The kind of films that this particular production company was associated with were mainly the saint films. So these saint films were actually films where which told the story of these mythics, or these ascetics who uh, had influenced uh, the culture or the people at that point of time. And these kind of films were influenced by the Sangeet Natak, which was actually a Marathi musical theatre. So this uh, particular production company also developed a very unique kind of a genre that, uh, was, uh, that was its own. Veer Santharam was a person who was closely associated as a director with this company and in the year uh, 1934 he made the film called Amrit Manthan which was actually a huge uh, success. Uh, moving on to another theatre which was the new theatre. This was established in the year uh, 1931 by B. N. Sarkar in Kolkata. And this particular, the kind of films that were produced from this particular studio were known for their technological innovations. And a lot of the films were based on the Bengali literature. So you had actors like Kundarnal Segal who were associated with this and directors like Nitin Bose who were associated with this particular studio. And the films that came uh, at that point of time were like Dhoop Chao which came in the year 1935 which introduced the concept of playback singing. In the year 1935, uh, the film Dev Das uh, was produced, but because this particular studio did not have a distribution system, it adversely affected its business and uh, in the year 1955, the studio folded. The next important studio uh, of the times was the Bombay Talkies, which was established by Himan Churai in the year 1934. Now, this particular studio was set up as a corporate business body. Himanshu Rai had travelled outside of the country and gained a lot of understanding of how the, uh, how the industry functions and put all of that knowledge to use in the setting up of this particular studio. So because he had done all of this, he had also been associated with uh, Indo-European films during that were produced during the silent era. And he worked extensively with the German uh, director Franz Austin. Uh, major actors uh, came to be associated with this production company over time, both pre-independence and post-independence. So, uh, and these people, these actors were uh, the huge names that actually we are also aware of. Our people, our actors like Devi Karani, Dev Anand and Raj Kapoor. The kind of films that were produced under this uh, studio were 
social reformist films and because that was also the general milieu of the country at that point of time people were looking for change india was already in the middle of this freedom struggle trying to build you know uh, trying to also build itself into a nation so all these things all these themes were reflected in the kind of films that were produced by this production uh, studio Uh, in the year 1943 the film kismat was produced which was actually the biggest pre independence hit in india however this studio also folded in the year 1955 and uh, but it had a major impact on the kind of films that were produced on the indian context finally we'll talk about another very important uh, uh, studio which was known as the wadia uh, movie town now this particular studio was established by in the year 1933 by the wadia brothers and why i say it like this this production uh, studio this film production studio had a very unique kind of a genre now as i said as it is every particular a uh, film studio was associated with its own kind of a film making but this one specifically was very very different this uh, uh, wadia movie town actually produced films which are known as the stunt films or the adventure films these were the films that were inspired by the western slapstick comedies and one personality that it gave to the indian film industry was that of the actor fearless nadia she was an actor who had been uh, who, who who was not indian by origin but of a, uh, but her parents were foreigners but she had lived in india for the longest amount of time since probably the uh, age of 4 and she was a person who did a lot of stunts so the kind of films that were made were actually structured around the kind of stunts that she would be able to perform uh, she shot into uh, fame in the year 1932 with the film called tufan mail and after the success that tufan mail received from the audiences a lot of similar films came into being such as the 1935 hunter wali and the 1936 miss frontier mail so wadia movie town established itself as this particular studio that did this really interesting twist on the uh, uh, stunt style where the protagonist was actually a woman a female and that to a female who performed her own stunts her own jumps her own sequences and that was a huge and that at, coming at that point of time it was a huge uh, it was a huge uh, uh, it was a very exciting time for uh, the audiences also Uh, in the year 1942 the wadia brothers sold the studio to uh, shantaram who then converted it into the rajkamal kala mandir studio while all of this was happening these studios had come up and you know cinema was gradually becoming a very powerful mode of communication and the filmmakers realized it too they realized it that cinema could be used for something that was beyond entertainment it it could be used as a very powerful tool for communication now the socio political milieu of the country would then start to manifest itself in the cinema of the time Uh, as already mentioned quite on quite a few times india was in the throes of the struggle for freedom so the filmmakers realized the potential of cinema as a tool for mass communication and the kind of films that were produced at that, at that point of time were imbued by these themes the social reformist themes Uh, specifically v shantaram and raj kapoor they made films that had very strong messages for the audience Now, some of the films that were produced and that had that kind of a feel to them you know the socio political commentary of, uh, on the uh, on the times were films like aadmi amrit manthan dharmatma andaz aag achhut kanya and aurat aurat in fact is a film that was remade and the remake is actually a much more a famous film which is all of us know as mother india so mother india was actually a remake of the film aurat which came out in the year 1940 now when all of this was happening gradually indian cinema was really gaining ground was really working towards uh, you know a very uh, a, a cinema that was relevant socially also and what all of this did was that it fostered the beginnings of the golden age in indian cinema which we will be talking about in the next lesson so let's do a quick summary of what we have talked about in this lesson we have talked about the arrival of sound and its consequent changes that were brought upon on the film form by the introduction of sound you know the introduction of the talky film the use of song and music in cinema and also how it went on to create this very unique uh, style of the uh, cinema that is quintessential to india
we also looked at some major films and filmmakers and the actors that were associated with this particular uh, era then we discussed the studio era specifically in the indian context and how it differed from the american one and what it did to and what it meant to indian cinema in the next lesson we will be talking about the impact of world war 2 and the partition of indian cinema so this was up till now what all had happened uh, till the pre independence post independence there were some major changes that happened and we'll be talking about them we'll also talk about the golden age of indian cinema and how the concept of nation building was at the core of the post independence cinema so i hope you've enjoyed the lesson today we'll meet next time <laughs>